hi everybody. Uh, welcome to the third Society for Conservation Biology North America student webinar series. I'm Krista. I'm not Melissa, so welcome a new face, but I'm also one of the members of the student webinar committee, uh, organizing committees. And yeah, we're really excited for um, today's presentation, which is Science at Conservation's Frontiers. Um, before I get started from the next few slides, I do want to do a land acknowledgement. So I want to acknowledge that the land we are gathered on, or at least I'm gathered on and hosting this presentation from, is the territory of the Awaswa speaking UP tribe, now represented by the Amamutsun tribal band, which is today working hard to restore traditional stewardship practices on this land. Also to note, um, we're recording this, so we're going to put it up online later on our um, society's uh, YouTube page. So if you'd like to watch this presentation later, you can go there. And the, there were links um, on the website and um, I believe in the registration link that you all got. Cool, and then a little bit more before we start of uh, background knowledge or information on our group. So again, we're the Society for Conservation Biology. This is particularly the North American chapter. And we, those of us who are hosting today are this um, subcommittee of students um, who are just trying to get more involved professionally in this organization. If you would like to also get involved, it does a lot of cool stuff. Um, yeah, it's got pretty big membership across um, North America. Here are some ways you can do that. I am not an official representative in terms of, I'm not practiced enough to say all of this stuff. So just look at it. You can see it later. If you wanna sign up for these um, groups, go to the um, website to learn more. Um, and then, but what I, what I do know about is if you would like to become part of this committee, please just reach out to any one of us. Um, but Melissa Cronin is kind of our main go-to representative. Um, she's here today in attendance and here is her email. If you would like to um, join us in organizing this event because um, yeah, we get to host really cool speakers and presentations and just upcoming FYI for all of you here, we do have um, a confirmed presentation on May 13th. Um, at the same time, which is multiple ways of knowing in conservation and ecology. And then here are a few more of the um, webinars we're hoping to host, uh, dates to be determined. Cool. Um, well, we did get, get to kick off 2020 with a number of great sessions, mainly focused on conservation career building, both inside and outside of academia. But for this month's webinar, we wanted to revisit the cool science and conservation challenges that inspired many of us to become part of this community. And our two speakers today, who I will briefly introduce here, and um, then we will go into more details um, in between their presentations. They both conduct research on how ecosystems and species are responding to our rapid changing world. And this endeavor often brings them to the frontiers of both our scientific knowledge and conservation practices. They're go both going to share a little bit about their academic and conservation journeys with us and a bit about how um, they've found some really cool and impactful um, research uh, in their work. So um, first, I'd like to introduce um, Dr. Haldre Rogers, who is an assistant professor in the Ecology, Evolution, and Organismal Biology Department at Iowa State University. And our second speaker is Dr. Brett Sheffers, who is an assistant professor at the Department of Wildlife Ecology and Conservation at the University of Florida. So um, I'm going to have the speakers first present. If you have questions, you can type them into the chat and we will collect those. And then we're gonna ask them at the end. So you can also raise your hand um, at the end and ask any questions, but we just ask, that like during the presentations or immediately following the first speaker, you just hold off on um, getting those answers until the end of the presentation. Um, all right, so first we're gonna have Dr. Rogers present and here's just a really quick introduction to get her ready while she's uh, got her slides up. Um, so our first speaker is Dr. Haldre Rogers at Iowa State, whose work focuses on the role of vertebrates in terrestrial systems with a particular focus on the ecological impacts of biodiversity loss. Her work elucidates what can happen to an ecosystem when we can't conserve a species or species, 
particularly those with keystone roles. I'm sure these answers like to that question are super complicated, but spoiler alert, Dr. Rogers' PhD thesis was titled, What is the Fate of a Silent Forest? The Impact of Complete Bird Loss on the Forests of Guam. She is currently director of the Ecology of Bird Loss Project on Guam, a project she started in her PhD and continues to devote much of her career to that ecosystem, which is often used as a cautionary tale. I'm not gonna say too much more. So Dr. Rogers, um, I'll get off and we can have you share screen. Please take it away. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Let me get my screen. Um, uh, thank you all for, um, for being here today and for this opportunity, Krista, to speak. Um, the, I will, as you did, start with an um, acknowledgement of the Mariana, of the Chamorro people. So the Mariana Islands are the ancestral homelands of the, um, and territories of the Chamorro people. And uh, this image is from the Festival of the Pacific, which happens every five years. And in this image, the people, the, um, the Chamorro people are welcoming all the visitors to the islands. And I, you know, the, the Marianas have been colonized for over 400 years by different colonial powers. Um, and I come in as a settler doing research there. Um, here, I am in Guam right now. Uh, and, um, but I want to really thank the people for being so welcoming and open to me coming here and doing work and sharing their knowledge. So I will start with that. And then, um, jump into the talk and you gave us several prompts. And so I just, I put the prompts in throughout this talk um, and hopefully to give you a little bit of structure here, but I'll start with just a bit of background of how I ended up with a career in ecology and conservation. Um, so I came from a really small town in Vermont. This is Burlington, Vermont here, Montpelier is the capital, tiny little town, if anyone has um, a, a tiny capital town. Um, and I grew up in some you know, small towns, less than a thousand people um, in rural Vermont. And when I first started school, went to this little one room schoolhouse in their town um, at, and then went on to um, a high school that had a graduating class of about 23. And then the whole time, I mean, I didn't, it felt like I was in the middle of nowhere and I didn't really uh, have access to a whole lot. Uh, it was just kind of, you know, out in the boonies. Um, but my parents were very curious and were very, and loved, um, loved teaching me about the plants and birds and being outside. They were kind of hippies living off the grid of sorts. <laughs> and uh, the a gardener and a carpenter. Um, and so I think I just had a big curiosity for trying to understand how the world works and also a desire to try to make it better um, from the time I was, uh, I was young. I will say one of the themes that I will touch on a, a bit here is that um, I think throughout my life, I've done things on my own timeline. So like in school, you know, I started elementary school um, before, uh, before I was supposed to because they didn't have any other classes and I already knew how to read and I wanted to go to school. But then, so some things I've done ahead of time and then other things I've done way behind time. And I think that that's just a theme. I don't know, there's no perfect way of doing anything in your career. So especially if, if any of you try to figure out what to do, I don't know, make your own timeline. Um, so I, when I graduated high school from my, um, from my little town, I wasn't really ready for college. And so I took a year off and moved down to DC where my aunt and uncle lived and volunteered at the Smithsonian. This is like my first, you know, leaving these little town where I felt like I was in the middle of nowhere and moving to a big city and working at the Smithsonian was just like the most mind blowing thing that I could do. You know, the fact that I could do that was just amazing to me. Um, so it was just sorting plants and um, they were coming from the Guyanas the, um, in the South America and to send them out to experts and sorting through termites with a termite expert. But it was just amazing work. So I did that for a year and, I, um, and then applied to college once I was felt like I was more ready to go. Um, and I went to a small school in upstate New York, Colgate, uh, which was also amazing. I loved it. Uh, small liberal arts school, you got to know everyone really well, but it didn't really have a lot of opportunities to do research. So I knew I was interested in ecology, um, but the research I ended up doing was on how snow algae mating is affected by different light regimes. Um, so there's not really a conservation in, like application of that, um, but it was you know a great mentor and a good opportunity to get into science. Um, 
but then when I finished, I struggled to get field jobs. I wanted to do some field work, but I didn't really have a resume that allowed me, you know, that made me competitive for jobs. And a lot of the jobs didn't have any, um, weren't paying jobs. And so I moved uh, to California and did some environmental education for a year and a half. And then I applied for a job that kind of ended up taking my career in a completely different direction. Um, which is, uh, I applied for a job on the island of Guam. So I was living in California. I really had no idea where Guam was. I didn't actually know it was in the Pacific at the time. All I knew was that it was an island somewhere and um, the, the brown tree snake was there because I learned about that in my conservation biology class. So just for anyone who doesn't know Guam, here is um, Japan, uh, Taiwan, Philippines, and then the Mariana Island chain here um, and it, here's the island of Guam and the Northern Marianas have Rota, Tinian, and Saipan. They're both commonwealths, or they're both territories of the United States. Um, Guam is a territory and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. So when I first moved to Guam, I, um, I, my job was to train people to search for the brown tree snake, which is this invasive snake that was introduced to Guam in the mid 1940s and it spread throughout the island. Sorry, there's an auto forward. You'll have to just work with me on that. Um, the, uh, so my job was to get these people together and train them to find snakes so that whenever a snake was reported on another island, we could bring a team of trained searchers to that island and then um, search for the snake and see if you could find the population before it got too big. Um, so this is the rapid response team. I spent three years traveling between different Pacific islands, um, setting up this response system and searching for snakes. We never found them on other islands, but we spent a lot of time searching. Um, it was amazing. I got to know all the people. I got to know the islands really well. And um, a system that had you know, spent a lot of time looking at forests in a system that had lost all of its birds, um, the island of Guam. This seemed like to, to be a massive change that no one was looking at. So after, um, three years in this position. So five years off between my undergrad and grad um, degree, I decided that I needed to go back to school in order to be able to get to that next step. Like do, I was, had kind of hit a ceiling in what I was capable, what I was able to do in this position. And um, I also decided that I um, would come back to the Marianas and look at the impact of bird loss on the forest. Everyone was studying the snake, but no one was really studying the impact of losing all the birds. So that brings me to the second question that um, was posed, which are what are the big ecology and conservation challenges of the study system? Um, as Krista mentioned in the beginning, uh, we, you know, defaunation, the loss of um, vertebrates is a massive problem all over the world. And it doesn't mean just full extinction. We've had remarkably few like total extinctions. We've had a lot of extirpations and massive declines where functionally a species is not actually, is not able to um, kind of play its role in an ecosystem. So I think that one of our big challenges is figuring out how these local extinctions or declines affects an ecosystem and then how you can restore the species interactions and a functioning system, given that we're not always gonna be able to get back to what the, the original complement of species that we started from. And I think islands are a great place to look at this because they have had um, experienced some of the greatest amounts of species loss um, over time. And, but also there's a lot of potential for being able to do restoration on islands um, and to do on an island wide scale, like you can make change in a way that can be a lot more difficult in the mainland. So the, the more specifically, the research that um, we have developed um, has been asking what happens to a system when it functionally loses all birds and how do you rebuild a functioning forest in this system? The, uh, the bad guy in the scenario is a brown tree snake. This is kind of a cute little picture of a small snake, but they can get quite large as well. And it was introduced to Guam in the mid 1940s to Rodi Peninsula right here, spread throughout the island um, throughout the next uh, 40 years and worked its way through the bird community. This is a picture taken by Nathan Sablon, who is a technician on um, uh, the Brown Tree Snake Project uh, of a snake eating a white tern, which is kind of a large bird for a snake to be able to put its mouth around. And we didn't think that it was going to actually be able to swallow this tern. Um, but sure enough, this is that same snake with the turn inside of it. So most of the time, the snakes eat fledglings um, and um, sometimes eggs, um, but they can you know, get down quite large birds as well. 
So this, the last confirmed records in the wild for many of the bird species in the Marianas is sometime in the 1980s. And you can see here, um, this is 1976 through 1996 um, on the, here I can put the um, laser pointer. There we go. Um, so 1976 to 96, you can see this decline in abundance of crow, fantail, most of the bird species, you'll see this decline to zero um, from bird, bird surveys that they did during this time period. And so you have a um, island, oh wait, maybe I'll have to change that back. Um, um. This is Ladaren Tonki on Saipan. You an island that used to sound like this, full of bird song. And now it sounds like this. This is a now on Guam. Oh, there you go. Um, so of the, I'll focus just on the frugivores because that's where much of my work has been. Um, but there are, we also have some work on pollinators and the insectivorous birds that have been lost or invertebrate feeding birds. Also, you'll note that there's a fruit bat in here, which is an important frugivore as well, uh, and not a bird at all. Um, but there were six uh, species of frugivores um, on the island. And of those, only two remain. There's a small population of fruit bats and a small population of Micronesian starlings, but most of the forests are completely silent um, and have lost all frugivores. So that means that um, that provides an opportunity to understand kind of the role and the importance of seed dispersal in the system because basically all vertebrate seed dispersal has stopped. So this third question is how, so I've set up this, this problem. We've lost all of the birds trying to figure out how, what that impact is on a forest and how we can um, restore it is the, the big challenge that I've been focused on. To tackle this, um, we, during grad, in grad school, I set up the Ecology of Bird Loss Project uh, that uh, seeks to, under, to advance both local and global science, local and global conservation, and support the next generation of local and global leaders. And I think in all of this, we've been trying to be at the intersection of questions that are locally relevant and important for conservation, but also kind of can inform global, um, global you know, patterns and questions and, um, and advance kind of our understanding of how the world works. The main um, approach is to compare Guam to nearby islands in the CNMI that still have birds. Um, and then to do experiments across these islands to be able to isolate the um, role of birds as opposed to other island to island differences. And what we've been able to show so far um, is that uh, frugivores benefit plants um, by changing the spatial pattern of seed rain. So with frugivores, you have seeds that get spread all throughout. Without frugivores, they fall underneath the parent tree. They can affect germination um, because of gut passage and most plant species do seem to benefit from gut passage. Um, and they can affect uh, how well species colonize new areas. So any plant species that really needs to get to a particular microsite, like a tree fall gap, if you're a light demanding species and you need to get to those highlight areas, those are the species that tend to be most strongly impacted by losing their dispersers. Um, surprisingly, we found the escape from parent. So this idea that there's high mortality underneath a parent tree, that and that's what underpins the Jens and Connell mechanism that some of you may have heard of. Um, that that doesn't seem to actually um, be a strong driver of change in the, in the um, population. So it's kind of a surprise, but certainly kind of the, these other three factors are strong. And then one of the things we found that was kind of surprising is that without dispersal, um, tree fall gaps like this gap, this is one that we created in 2014, um, and what, this is two years later, the recruitment in these tree fall gaps is really low. And it, largely because of the pioneer species depend upon vertebrates to move around and without any birds or bats to move those pioneer species around, um, there's not much growing in these gaps on Guam. Whereas so this is the same gap that we created, uh, a gap we created at the same time on Rhoda where there are plenty of um, dispersers and you can see just this, you know, what you might expect in a jungle um, for regeneration. So, um, so overall, it seems like without frugivores, you're gonna have a forest that's gonna be more open and gappy. It's gonna have lower diversity because a lot, especially with the pioneer species um, can, having lower recruitment. Uh, and um, yeah, and we'll, so there'll be kind of slow degradation over time and loss of species diversity. 
So the question is, how do you fix it? And uh, uh, my PhD was spent really trying to understand how bad it was. And then now I've been able to switch over into thinking about how we restore a forest. And one of the first questions is, you know, which birds do we need to get back first? Um, so we just finished a, a project that evaluated these five bird species that are still present on other islands and um, could be either reintroduced to Guam or for the Micronesian starling have their range expanded on Guam. And um, I won't uh, talk in detail about these, but I'll just note that the top two candidates are the Micronesian starling um, and the Mariana fruit dove. And the starling eats the most plant species. It um, positively affects gut passage, or gut passage positively affects germination. It moves to seeds a long way, and they move seeds from intact forests to degraded areas so they can help replant the next forest um, uh, in those areas that have been disturbed. Which is great because the Micronesian sterling is still present on the island of Guam. And so that means it can be part of the solution that's going to be easier than reintroducing another bird species. Um, however, it, it there's we found that snakes and cats do eat a lot of birds. So this is from telemetry that we've been doing on Guam of Micronesian starlings. Um, and green here at the top, um, this is for 2017, 2018, and then 2019 and 20. So green shows what proportion are alive. So somewhere between two and 17% of fledglings that we tag survive. Um, these brighter yellow is the proportion killed by cats. Um, so somewhere between 10 and 26% get eaten by cats. And then the three blue colors all combined um, to give you the proportion eaten by um, snakes. And uh, it's somewhere in the um, 30 to 45%, I think, range of um, fledglings are eaten by snakes. The snakes are eating a lot of the birds, even in the area where Micronesian starlings are persisting. So the solution is going to have to be keeping snakes away from birds um, or killing snakes. So this is a nest box that um, collaborators built that you can put on telephone poles and snakes can't climb these poles. So this improves nest success. And then there is a plan to drop lots of these um, these are pinky mice with a Tylenol on them that get put into these little containers and get dropped from helicopters over kind of larger areas in order to be able to control snakes and potentially reintroduce birds. Um, so that so it's exciting to think about a future where there may be birds back on Guam across the landscape again. Um, it's hard and we're not there yet, but we're definitely moving towards that direction. Some of the next steps that we want to go at, and we just were funded for a project that allows us to understand the plant pollinator interactions in addition to the fruit frugivore interactions. Um, so one of the things I forgot to say is in my, my like five years off before grad school, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to focus on specifically. And I realized that I didn't, that I really just like thinking how, about how everything is interacting. I don't actually love birds or plants or insects or frogs or any of those things, but I like thinking about how everything interacts. And so much of my career has just been slowly putting together this web of interactions and trying to understand how they, um, how it disassembles and can be reassembled. So in this project, we'll put together the red or all of the fruit frugivore interactions for the major plant species in the forest. And then the yellow indicate all of the plant pollinator interactions for the same plant species. I'm trying to look across these different interaction types to understand um, how the plants will be affected by bird loss is the goal. And then we also have a project where, you, where we're using a, a lot of metabarcoding to put together the food web network as well across the islands and to understand how changes in arthropods might, our arthropods might have changed and what the diet is of those um, predatory arthropods like spiders, which we find a lot more of on Guam. There's tons more spiders on Guam than on other islands. Um, so that's kind of where we're heading is putting together more of those networks. I just want to note that one of the most rewarding parts for me has been training and mentoring students um, and primarily uh, or in particular students from the Mariana. So Anne-Marie, Gerilyn and Christiana um, here are three students in my lab from the Marianas and it's been um, really inspiring to be able to kind of help them figure out what research areas they want to um, work on and uh, help them you know, work on their master's or PhD um, and become experts in those areas on their own islands. And also uh, we've run field courses for students from Guam Community College, Northern Marianas College and University of Guam to be able to get people more experience in the field and learning how to do science, um, as well as having kind of lots of different people on field crews. I think we've had over 150 people on field crews over the years um, out there. 
Um, and we also realized that there was a big gap in terms of um, communication among scientists in the islands and among the science, scientists and the people. So there's, you know, all of this research going on, but it wasn't, there's was no way of communicating that um, between people. And so we started like uh, 2017, a group of us started the Marianas Terrestrial Conservation Conference to be able to encourage this um, dialogue and help push forward um, can plans for restoration that incorporate all of you know, different all these different viewpoints about where we want to head um, in terms of restoration of the islands. And then finally, I just want to note that the part of the reason I'm here right now is because this little island, Cocos Island off southern Guam, is um, has never had snakes on it, but it was recently uh, snakes were found last year. It has a lot of native birds left still on it. It's um, just a couple miles off the coast of um, Southern Guam right here. Uh, and so there's been this effort of trying to figure out how, like the when the snake was introduced to Guam back in the forties and then when they realized the snake was eating the birds, it was kind of too late on the main island of Guam um, in the early 1980s. Here we have an opportunity to actually you know, get rid of the snake before it eats all the birds. The question is whether we can actually do it. And I think that's been what I've, um, what I've been focusing a lot of my last um, month or two on is trying to figure out how we can get a response to be able to get rid of snakes off the small island. So just a couple of summary points. Um, I think, you know, take your time. You're on your own timeline. There's no need to follow something that someone else expects. Um, and explore and be curious. I think there's lots of cool questions out there. Um, and cool uh, and exciting things to look at. And I think one of the things I love about academia is being able to you know, go in any direction that I think is interesting. Um, I have decided to take a really place-based focus on my research. And I you know, sometimes question the value, like whether that's valued in academia, but I think from a conservation perspective, perspective that has been really huge because I know the people I can talk, I can talk to local leaders about and local natural resource managers about what science need, what science needs they have and try to link our re research to their needs. Um, and uh, I can get to know, there's just so many ways having a long time and in the same system has been really beneficial to me. Um, and so I, I think that there is, I would hope that we can um, value real place-based research programs um, more in the future. I think that there's been a, a push for global, which I totally value as well. Being able to look across lots of systems is really valuable, but being able to kind of dig deeply into one system, I think is also has its benefits. And then I would say one of the things that our lab has been talking a lot about has been, you know, how to decolonize field research. I'm, I am a settler working in a place that has been colonized. And we think often about how we're going to change, how we can and will and should and are changing um, kind of the way field research is done in the Marianas and who's doing it, who's asking the questions. Um, I think that this has been one of the more kind of powerful things that, we've, that I've been thinking about lately. And with that, I will just thank a whole bunch of collaborators and grad students and uh, funders and leave you with a picture of an island, an island picture. This is Guam. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Dr. Rogers. Thanks. Great. Um, well, just to keep going with time, we'll save questions till the end. And I'm going to um, introduce Dr. Sheffers. So quickly, our second speaker that I have the privilege of introducing is Dr. Brett Sheffers from the University of Florida. His research spans a number of tropical locations and topics and is united in its, in its examination of how global change, particularly climate and anthropogenic change is impacting species communities. He is well known for his canopy research, which studies climate sensitive species in tropical forests and examines how climate change is causing vertical shifts in their distribution, conserving these species off, that are often understudied and sometimes rare, presents unique challenges, particularly if you have to, for example, conserve their thermal niches. But Dr. Sheffers is also very involved in um, other topics, including studying global wildlife trafficking. I can't wait to hear more about what latest trees he's climbed or the species he's found. So please, Dr. Sheffers, tell us all about it. Thanks. So as uh, Krista pointed out, I'm gonna be talking about um, canopy research today, um, but I just wanted to, if I can get my slides here. Um, I just wanted to start out by just showing a bit of a map of where my 
my lab primarily works, um, graduate students, postdocs, research assistants, et cetera. Um, currently we're active kind of pantropically. Um, I started off in Asia for my PhD, um, working in the Philippines and Borneo um, in Malaysia. And then I moved over, can, I'm hoping everyone can see my cursor, I assume you can. Moved over to Australia for my postdoc and I started working, um, working in canopies in Australia. Um, and since I joined um, the faculty at University of Florida, I've kind of expanded out and um, exploited the convenience of being close to Central and South America, um, which is fabulous. Um, and so anyways, my, my, my point is, is that we study in a, a variety of places, a diverse taxa, um, and also themes. Like Krista said, uh, we work on um, wildlife trade, uh, your kind of your conventional conservation issues, habitat fragmentation, connectivity, lots of climate change science. Um, today, I'm gonna to talk to you about something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and that is canopy science. When I started my PhD in Singapore, National University of Singapore, I, I had moved from the University of Alberta in Canada. And when I got on the plane, it was, I think, minus 56 degrees Celsius. And when I got off the plane, it was plus uh, 41 degrees Celsius. I had arrived during a heat wave. And so in, in about a 24 hour period of time, I went through like a hundred degree Celsius differential. And my physiology just, I mean, I'd have to go to work and I, I literally packed four or five shirts a day. It was like, I had my walk to the bus shirt. I had my walk to the Hawker Center shirt. I had my afternoon walk shirt, back home shirt. Uh, I, you know, my capillaries just couldn't keep up with uh, the change. Um, the, anyways, but, I, I digress slightly, um, but that physiological shock that I felt led me to thinking about e ecophysiology. Um, and it also, um, as I was exploring kind of the, the, the rainforest and the habitats in Asia, I immediately fell in love with um, emergent dip, uh, dip, uh, dipterocarp trees. Uh, very unique place um, and a very unique habitat type. Um, and the Amazon has emergent trees, but they just don't really compare to those of Southeast Asia. And in the forest there, it's just so complex and, and, and structured and tall and amazing. And I had a past uh, in a love for rock climbing and it was just natural that as I looked up, I thought, I wonder if I could climb that. And the answer was yes. And the other thing that was very apparent is um, because they're so structured, there's this amazing light gradient. I don't know if you've ever been in a rainforest, but I mean, literally like you could be in darkness and it's daytime, depending on how dense the forest is. And corresponding with that darkness is, you have this you know, light to dark gradient and corresponding with that is a hot to warm or hot to cool gradient in climate. And so I started thinking about this vertical climate gradient um, and at the same time, I was going to Borneo, there are a lot of mountains, and I started, it just seemed very interesting to me, this juxtaposition of a vertical climate gradient where the top of the tree is hot and the bottom of the tree is cold, and on the top of the mountain is cold and the bottom of the mountain is hot, and yet the trees are on top of the mountains, and so you have this nested but inverse climate gradient. Um, that lends itself really well for teasing apart kind of distributional patterns at a local scale and then thinking about how those patterns change as you move across landscapes. And that really um, set up, basically, it was, it was kind of just kind of, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of going out and just walking in forests or wetlands or whatever you got to do and just having a think. Um, because all the good questions come from being in um, the environment that you intend to study. Um, and even for those of you who are macroecological, um, I also extend, I, I challenge you as well to get out into the systems that you are studying. Um, because I, my lab, we do a lot of macroecology, but, but it is mandated. You cannot start a project unless you have visited the place in which you are studying. Um, it just, you cannot ask creative uh, questions unless you're out in the field. Um, anyways, I'm being chatty Cathy, or you get the point. So, um, so where did I end up doing my work? I, I fell in love with the Philippines. I had a collaborator there. 
who um, Arvind Desmos, who's a wonderful um, amphibian ecologist, and he recommended that I go check out this place called Mount Bonahau. It's this old caldera uh, mountain. You can see how it kind of the, the lid blew off of it um, a long time ago. Um, but what's wonderful about this mountain, it, it ranges from about 500 to 2100 meters. So there's a good uh, elevation gradient, beautiful, pristine, um, old growth rainforest. Um, and, um, and it spans about 500 to 2100 meters. So there's a that there, you have a good gradient to work with. And so I began kind of my, my PhD work here in the Philippines. And as you walk up, if I go back here, if you walk up this ridge right here, uh, right here, you kind of walk up this ridge, you get to this little flat place. It's around um, 1,100 meters, give or take. Um, and you come to a place called Camp Kalula. And this was our research camp. Uh, we lived there for several months in the rainforest. And so it's a little bit of a kind of more permanent camp that we set up there. Kalula is the genus for a frog that was super common there. You would never drink a, a, a glass of water sitting on the, on the table without checking it first because so many times people are putting their lips up to their drink and a frog jumps into their mouth. Um, they were as abundant as it can get. So uh, properly named Camp Kalula. And we worked on canopy science work and thinking about this kind of multi-dimensionality and species distribution, vertical by horizontal. Um, climate change was a big theme for us. Um, and then also thinking about kind of microhabitats and refugia. So if climate changes, whether it be short term or long term, where can species persist to kind of escape the heat or the dryness or whatever might be uh, an issue for them? And um, our focal taxa were amphibians. Um, and so, I mean, thinking about ref refuge is particularly important since they're water loving and then also thermally sensitive. Um, here are some, you know, I mean, maybe this is familiar to some, maybe new to others. You know, we, we cooked over fire and we had our little, you know, kitchen here. Um, here are climbing ropes and over in this bottom right corner here, you can see this is our incubator where we did thermal experiments. We did uh, thermal tolerance experiments on uh, frogs and lizards, a little sitting area, um, you know, just kind of a, a, a little bit more robust field station, um, but comfortable and, and nice. And, um, here is my wonderful research team during my PhD. Um, and I don't know, besides for just a photo of everyone smiling. Um, here's an example of, you know, what it might look like if you're going to want to do canopy research. Uh, height is part of the equation, obviously. Um, but it gives you just this wonderful thrill and kind of adrenaline. If you're an adrenaline seeker, this is a good place to start. Um, just more here. This is a wonderful view. Um, you know, um, on that face of the mountain, you, it, at nighttime, we climb during the day. And the way we usually do is we rig a tree and we put our ropes up and we'll do a, a daytime survey, ground to canopy. And then we repeat the same survey, ground to canopy at night. So it's a day and night. And so this is a nighttime survey where I emerged out of the canopy and I had this just, I mean, every once in a while you get these moments um, where life is just good. Um, and this was a moment for me. I remember every moment of this climb. Um, it was just this calm, beautiful day. And I got up above the trees, which, um, um, and, and was able to kind of see Manila in the distance there, really pretty sight. Um, here is Platymantis lusinensis. Uh, so really cool thing about the Philippines is that they have um, these highly arboreal, uh, arboreal frogs that use direct development as their reproductive mode. And they use these epiphytes in the trees. It's like, it's almost, a, it's a very similar um, system to frogs that breed in bromeliads in the neotropics. These frogs have evolved almost a convergent pathway to reproducing um, and asplenium ferns, however, via direct development, not uh, laying tadpoles in, like they do in bromeliads. Um, oh, and, and here, who's this person? Um, this person looks familiar. Um, so Krista, I, I, I know her because she joined um, us in Madagascar and was uh, amazing. And 
even stayed there for Christmas. And so this was them celebrating Christmas. You can see the ornaments hanging here off of a splenium fern. So the splenium fern occur from um, Asia all the way into Africa. And so we replicated a lot of this work from the Philippines in Madagascar. And, um, and here's uh, Ed Basham, who is a PhD student who just finished in my lab a couple, uh, just last week actually, so. So as we're climbing trees, we find frogs. Here's uh, Gilles, He's, uh, he was a, a, a assistant in the lab and he pulled out this wonderful frog out of this tree hole. And we had a photographer with us at the time to capture the very moment he found it. Um, and then we put the frog in a little plastic bag and we continue our surveying. And then later we'll go down to the ground and process the frog, uh, looking at kind of morphometrics and weight and all those other variables that people find interesting. So why? So what? Is, what am I studying in the canopy? Um, one of the main themes that we work with is this concept called vertical stratification, and basically all that is is you know you have this structural distribution from ground to um, to canopy, and some species might have a niche breadth that is broad. They might go from ground to canopies. Others might just be specific to the ground. And this parallels with this climatic gradient that I was telling you about. That's important that you can see kind of how it's hot and then it's cool um, towards the ground. And, and here's some data from actually some of the surveys that Crystal was involved with. Um, you can see here, these are just species of frogs. And I mean, just an example, um, um, it kind of got shifted there, but you can see 13 species of frog on the ground four species of frog um, specific. So these are specialized to the canopy. And then you get kind of this mixing of species, uh, it, a, a basically kind of a, a linear turnover from the ground to the canopy in some ways. And I like to equate it to a, um, a layered cake, right? So each layer kind of has a unique community. Uh, and as you move up in space, just like in mountain systems or with latitude, you have uh, community turnover um, with with distance from ground or from canopy down to the ground, whichever way you look at it. So, um, okay, so we, we've kind of established, okay, vertical stratification. I'm going to give you kind of um, uh, two or three examples, very, very short examples of how we can apply canopy science in what I think are kind of unique fun ways to understand to like test um, ecological concepts um, that maybe are generally more applicable for kind of broader macro scales, the larger gradients of altitude and latitude. Um, the, that climate gradient that we study in forests, so think about this, it's 30 meters of forest, right? 30 meters. And in that 30 meter space, owing to the complexity of these forests, it generates climate gradients from two to five, several degrees Celsius in 30 meters. To get that same change with altitude and latitude, you have to go um, over a thousand meters in altitude and several kilometers. So we're talking kilometers of space and latitude, right? So there's a huge steepness to that gradient. Precipitation is even more steep. It's almost a 15% difference in relative humidity for between sometimes 20 between the canopy and the ground. So very steep climate gradients they lend themselves well to looking at how ecological patterns change relative to climate and changes in habitat structure. So we could test concepts of biogeography at this kind of micro scale. And I also hope maybe I can conclude very briefly, I'm not really focused on conservation here directly. There's application to conservation, ranging from climate change, habitat loss, even invasion, invasion ecology. So, um, Here's a wonderful view from the Amazon in Ecuador. Um, and you can see how complex the, this forest is. And so the general theory here is that when you have lots of complexity, right, you get greater niche space. That allows for coexistence. And that usually happens via the partitioning in that space of animal niches. So that's a general theory that we're working with, okay? Now, the issue here is that habitat complexity and climate are collinear. So if we want to like figure out like what is the dominant driver of, of, you know, like why does an animal go up or down? I mean, it has to deal with its physiological constraints, but also its habitat constraints. The issue is, is that you can't, they're not independent, right? 
because our most stable climatic regions of the world tend to have the greatest habitat complexity, i.e. The, the tropics, um, the equatorial regions of the world. And so we tend, to, we tend to have this kind of paradigm where it's this interaction between habitat and climate generates these richness patterns. What, I'm, what I hope, maybe, maybe you might appreciate it, maybe I just think this is silliness, but um, what I'm thinking is, is you know, maybe we can use a vertical niche. Now the vertical niche is almost this mediator, right? Because you need the habitat and you need the climate. And ultimately this is a, a trait that is very sensitive to either one of these components. And so perhaps we could rectify this complication of like what drives species richness patterns by focusing on the vertical niche rather than some of these other variables that we traditionally explore. So how does that work out? So two questions for today. Do communities vertically assemble across latitude? So I'm going to address this whole, uh, how do we, you know, this vertical niche rectifying collinearity using question one. And then we're going to um, think about other kind of more nuanced factors that might influence vertical stratification. I'll give you two examples later on. So here's Bruno Oliveira. He's a macroecologist. He hates the field. For you, you'll never see Bruno enjoying a good walk in the forest. He thinks it's silliness. Um, he might argue with you about this now. Um, but Bruno was not a, a field ecologist. It, we, we often argued about this um, and whether or not he should become one. Um, but he created this wonderful database called Amphibio, which is a trait database for amphibians, and it's a global database. And we started talking about canopy science and all the ideas that I think are interesting, and he kind of yawned a bit. I woke him up a bit, yawned again. Finally, I convinced him to maybe think about vertical stratification and how we can study it um, in a macroecological context. And so what we did is we used this database. We connected it with species richness maps of amphibians. So basically every cell in the earth has a number of species, a community, because they occur there. And then we use this trait database, which has arboreal, is the species arboreal, fossorial, meaning underground, or terrestrial on the ground, um, just to explore how does like ratios within a community change from being predominantly arboreal to fossorial or terrestrial, et cetera. And what we found was that you know, and, and this might not be a huge surprise to people, but where you find trees in lots of water, you find a lot of arboreal species. So you tend to find a dominance of arboreality in tropical regions. In you, near your Hadley cells in those subtropical regions, you tend to get more fossoreality denoted by this um, magenta red color. Um, and then in, in your um, seasonal places, you get um, terrestriality. Let me just check my time here. All right, I gotta hurry up. Talk ten times faster. Okay, so, um, so with latitude on the y, you see the equ equatorial region. You basically see this is just plotting that pattern. You can see that the fossorial groups, the proportion fossoriality and arboreality, are just their opposite patterns almost perfectly. So what's so what you know, and not only that, but in your most species-rich places, you tend to have the most arboreality, which possibly makes sense because of the most habitat and most potential for niche partitioning, et cetera. Um, so that, that is these little, I'm, I'm hoping this, so this is just percent of the community that's arboreal, percent of the community that's fossorial, and we're relating that to richness by these different realms globally. And there's very consistent patterns for the most part. So um, what this is basically showing that there's this latitude trait gradient and that um, there's this vertical niche that is predictably changing with latitude. We then want to know what drives that. Like, what are the, so what are some of these classic macroecological variables that people use to understand species richness? You have your precipitation, temperature variation, whether it be monthly or daily, historical climate velocity, uh, topography, the mountainscapes, and habitat complexity. And this is basically like tree density by the height of the forest. And what we found is um, you know, arboreality and fossorial opposite. Well, who, who, I mean, who figures, right? Like one climbs a tree and one goes under the ground and they dip, different things predict them. But what is super exciting here is that it, it makes sense, right? Because when you're in a desert 
and you're dealing with climatic variation and you're a frog that is susceptible to desiccation, you either could move or you retreat. And in this case, you retreat underground, right? And underground is the most climatically buffered place in a desert for you to go. And so it makes sense that in highly dynamic, thermally dynamic places, you go underground. However, if you are spoiled um, and you have lots of water and you have lots of trees, then you don't have any physiological constraints per se and you climb. And, and, and so evolution takes hold and you get niche partitioning and voila, you get a tropical rainforest. So, um, so anyway, so climate instability drives fossil reality, precipitation habitat complexity drives arboreality. Okay, make a mental note, don't let that go. Next slide. So that's a spatial uh, element to this vertical stratification, but we know there are two components to scale, space and time. Uh, what about time? Because we know in tropics, you know, not all tropical forests are the same. Um, you know, yeah, they might be thermally stable, but the seasonality, like it's so funny when I'm talking to my some of my students from the neotropics, I'm like, oh, you know, uh, in, in the fall, or we talk about seasons, you know, the winter, for them, winter is when it's dry. You know, like their concept isn't winter cold, winter is dry. Whereas, you know, you say, oh, winter is somebody from North America, but, oh yeah, it's cold, you know. And, and so their perception of seasonality is rain patterns. Um, and frogs are no different. They think, frogs in the tropics think of seasonality in terms of rain patterns. And I hope I can convince you of that here. So this is um, some work we did looking at temporal shifts, seasonal shifts in this vertical, uh, in the in vertical stratification of communities. And, um, we did, this is just a distribution of trees. We did our work in Panama, um, same kind of principles as we did in Madagascar and the Philippines. Um, but Panama is wonderful because it has a very distinct dry season and it has a really nice white, wet season. So what we did is we sampled across the year transitioning from wet to dry or dry to wet. And um, basically what we found is during the the wet season, um, you, you can see that really structurally complex, lots of species, uh, x-axis is height, lots of species occurring above ground and really high richness. But in the dry season, you get this loss of species richness as well as most things hugging the ground, right? Not much change on the, in the ground. This is zero, this is on the ground here, but dramatic change one meter and above. Right? I mean, just all the species disappear from the system. So there seems to be this like shift towards the ground. And if we plot that, like an abundant shift at the community scale across all the frog species in this system. Now this here is like a height shift. So if it's negative, it means that they shifted towards the ground in the dry season. You can see here that the average is some five, six meters. So what is that? That's 15 to 18 feet, right? But there are some species like Christy Mantis here who shift 10 meters and this poison dart frog that had a 30 meter shift. And what's super awesome about this poison dart frog, um, this Fulgaritis, is that it actually has micro migrations. It's one of the few animals I could think of in the world that has phenological migrations of 30 meters in space that it does from one season to the next. It goes up to the canopy to breed in the wet season, down and then it retreats to the ground during the dry season and it does this season to season, season to season. It, you know, so when we think about wildebeest doing the great migration across the Serengeti, we need to give mad props to this little dude here for doing his big climb of 30 meters. So um, what's next? Um, I'm going to quickly finish. I, um, I think I have, um, we're getting close. Okay. The last bit, so in ecological theory is this idea of species interactions, right? So these things have to partition in space, but we often like ignore the fact that things interact. And if Haldra made any like crescendo explosion point, it is things like to eat things and competition is rife. And so we cannot ignore species interactions. I've, I've ignored them for too long. So now I'm trying to deal with it. Um, and, and so um, my student, Jesse Borden, did this great study on two species of brown anole in Florida, green anole and brown anole. One is an invasive species. And um, it was introduced in the 1950s. 
And I'm just gonna give you the quick summary here, but when you have brown anoles by themselves, they're on the ground. And when you have brown anoles with green anoles in the system, they're on the ground, right? They, their preferred niche is between one or zero and one meters. But when you go to the native green anole, when it's by itself, right, it's basically in the same niche space as the brown anole. It's zero to one meters. However, when the introduced non-native species is within its habitat proximity, it, it does a, 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 an upward shift in its vertical niche preference by nine meters, that's 27 feet. So here we see this introduced um, the, uh, highly aggressive brown anole causing this niche shift in the vertical preference of, brown, of green anoles. So, um, so that's a lizard. I thought that was a really good example of the, this interaction and how verticality could be plastic. I'm gonna give you one more very quick um, food for thought um, example uh, with amphibians because amphibians are more tied to water. And so they're, in, uh, reptiles are free of a lot of, a lot of the physiological constraints. So perhaps the anole isn't the best system. It's, it's pronounced, but maybe it's not the best. So how can we parse out this water by interactive, um, um, how can we parse out the effect of water versus species interaction? And so we use um, this experimental approach where we use two native frogs, a green tree frog and a scroll tree frog, and the non-native um, Cuban tree frog here in the bottom right. And we use a variety of factors. We looked at hydration status and posture and then and competition and water availability. And just to give you a quick schematic, we had these little experimental enclosures. We introduced a frog at a perch, and then we gave them three water or two water treatments in a control. So one is all water, it's a full. The other is high water in the canopy and then low water, you know, so water towards the ground, right? And that's kind of replicating kind of seasonal patterns of precipitation out in the environment. And then we, took that, those water treatments, and we had a no interaction, a competitor interaction, and a predator interaction. This competitor is the two natives crossed. The predator is crossed with the Cuban because they tend to eat the native frogs. And we wanted to know how do the frogs, one, respond to the water treatments, but two, does the species interaction interfere with the classic response? Um, we've done this in Florida. Here's an example of another. We've now replicated this in Madagascar as well. I just wanted to show you what these enclosures look like. And very quickly, because I know probably people are tired of me talking. So this gray line here dotted indicates the full water treatment, right? So this is a shift in the vertical, vertical niche position from that perch. And so under full, that's kind of like the basal niche preference. And the way we, um, so this is green squirrel and Cuban, and then what they're crossed with uh, vertically. So if we just look at a few examples, let's just look at green. When green is by itself, which is the dotted line, it has a niche preference above the, the, the perch when there's no water constraints. When we shift the water down, the niche shifts down. When we shift the water up, the niche shifts up. And we see this consistently. If we look at this dotted line in each panel, squirrel, it goes down, squirrel goes up. Now the Cuban is a little bit of a fickle beast. It does, its niche preference is actually kind of where it was. And so under a low, it doesn't shift and under a high, it does go up. So the Cuban is a little bit, I'm not sure what the, is the deal with the Cuban. And then these colors are what the species was crossed with. And this is new. You know, sometimes, you know, it's not good to try to present new information because it's not highly analyzed. So just bear with me. But um, you can see here, I just tried to air aid it with arrows. So here's the no interaction. And then when it's crossed with the competitors, predators, they shift down. Here, they shift up. Here, they shift down, shift down, shift up. So um, my point here is that water is important it's very clear that they track their niches by water, which we saw in the field akin to that Basham paper. Biotic interactions have the potential to affect niche preference and affect the magnitude at which animals shift. Um, 
And with that, I'm going to skip my conclusion slide because I'm already over time. But how does this apply to conservation? Um, well, climate change might flatten rainforest biodiversity. It might cause downward shifts. We know habitat fragmentation causes drying and heating up of the landscapes, i.e. downward shifts. And we also know that invasive species and novel interactions also interrupts the ability for animals to naturally kind of utilize their preferred niche space. So anyways, I, I think this might, I hope maybe you might see thinking about the vertical dimension as fodder for maybe applying it to your system if it's, if it's um, appropriate. So with that, I will take questions. Awesome. Or I'll Thanks. With your questions. <laughs> Thanks, Brett and Holdre. Uh, yeah, those were two fantastic talks. I really appreciate both of your time today. Um, we're a little bit over on the hour, but we can take a couple questions if folks want to stay and have something burning to ask other of our two presenters. Um, if both of you have the time to stay on a little bit longer, that would be awesome. Uh, anyone is on here now who wants to ask something to either of the two, please go ahead. Um, I have a question for Brett. Um, so when you were talking about the species interactions, did you notice um, any species that like modified the environment that other species needed to survive? Like, could that be kind of a factor in regulation of the shifts as well? So the, the only, um, so modification could be if, if water, if those microhabitats are real estate, they're prime real estate, then the dominant, the, the predator competitor is excluding them. So the mere presence of the predator basically causes the native animals to use vertical niches that they wouldn't otherwise prefer. And so, so there's exclusion from, let's say, refuge. Like the, the, these little cups are like our little refuges. Right, because the rest of the treatment is dry. And so in, in it's a relatively dry environment under these experiments. And so it's to force them to utilize the cups. And so it's more exclusionary, if that makes sense. If it, it, it wouldn't necessarily be habitat. None of this, all animals that I work with are habitat modifying. Per se, they're more. It's more about a, It's more about utilizing the beneficial habitat. I think there's some questions for you both in the chat too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Mel. Um, how, I'll ask this one from Nika um, for Haldria. Uh, how are cats involved in your bird reintroduction hopes? Are cats a barrier to reintroduction? Or do you think, hypothetically, snake removal would be enough? My understanding is that snakes cause bird extinctions, but then you have your cat issue. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I think we've been surprised at, at how badly, how much the cats are having an impact on the starlings only because we, you know, like the big story of Guam is that snakes are the main predator. And so to have, uh, you know, I think this year it's about half and half snakes and cats like doing, you know, causing the mortality. And uh, it seems to have gotten a little bit more over time. So I, and I think if you took away snakes, probably cats would just have more food. So like they'd probably increase their impact. I think it's gonna take um, controlling multiple predators at the same time. Cats are a little bit um, like socially more challenging to control because people love cats. And so there's like feeding stations for cats that um, where the Micronesian starling population still is. So it's gonna take a, um, a bunch of work to try to convince people that we can control cats, but I think you need to do both at the same time. Yeah, 
that's a issue in Hawaii too. Um, cool, thank you. I have another question here from Carla, uh, although maybe Brett, you got at it a little bit. She, she asks, has climate change affected the vertical niche of the species within trees? And I think you've kind of, Carla, did, is that a question you're still interested in or did um, he answer that? Um, I, I could actually kill two birds with one stone here because I, I see another question about something similar. Um, well, with, with climate change, is there a chance that frogs would move north rather than up down trees? So the, the, the first to address, uh, I, I believe it was Carla's question um, about the, has climate change affected the vertical niche? Um, we, it's mainly time for space substitutions that we're using here. Um, we haven't really been doing the work long enough to actually see um, long-term trends in, in, in this compression. But we know that frogs are very responsive. So for example, in El Nino, La Nina, there are some like really like scant records they like buried down into the great lit uh, gray literature of like all of a sudden these researchers getting huge influxes of arboreal frogs during these record breaking dry events, even dry events during the wet seasons that are just atypical. So we know this can happen really quickly. And so it, it's interesting to think about this vertical response is almost like an early detection system for systems under stress. I mean, it's promising, right? I mean, it means they have flexibility and plasticity kind of built into them. That links in nicely with um, um, Barbara. I, I apologize if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. Um, but the question here was about climate change. Um, like, wouldn't the frog, could the frogs just move along a latitudinal or elevation gradient rather than up and down trees? And that's actually a really interesting idea. And so the early detection system idea is that the first response is to shift down and compress. And then the second response is to shift up with altitude or across latitude. Um, but either one is a little bit interesting because the, I would say that the, the altitude and latitude response would be more population level, whereas this compression is more kind of individual responses. Um, and so they're, they're similar, but slightly different things, if that makes sense. Cool. Um, thank you. I wonder, uh, I think there's a couple more questions, um, but I wonder if we're getting close to the 115, maybe we might actually want to wrap it up. And in which case, um, can we put both speakers, would you mind putting, if you're comfortable, your emails um, in the chat box in case anyone else wants to email you with a question regarding your talk? Um, these are both great presentations. I learned a ton. Um, and yeah, so the link for this YouTube um, presentation is gonna go out to everyone who registered. So if you wanna watch this again, um, both of these great presentations, it'll, it'll be there and you'll have that information. You can also Google um, the society and there'll be a YouTube page associated. So yeah, thank you so much everyone for attending.